continued the reconquest of other forts and provinces. Admiring his pluck and daring and pleased with his zealous allegiance to the Sultan's family, the hereditary supporters of the Nizam Shahi, the loyal gentry and nobility, now came over to Shahaji. The disbanded soldiery of the Nizam Hahi state, who had for some time been roving over the country in search of adventures flocked to Shahaji's standards. Thus, from day to day did his party wax in strength, and his military resources continue to augment. Shahaji now subdued all the Konkan country which had once been under the Nizam Shahi, all the territory up to Ahmadnagar on the caste and the country from the Nira to the Chandya mountains in the south. Shahaji's next move was upon Junnar. Srinivas Rao ruled there in independence. He was, as we have seen, and great friend of Shahaji. But Shahaji saw that the Nijamshahi kingdom could not regain its fallen power and prestige until the recalcitrant nobles, who had declared themselves independent were brought back under its allegiance. He, therefore, tried to conciliate Srinivas Rao into an acknowledgement of his Nijamshahi suzerain. But Sri Nivas Rao was entirely governed by selfish plans. He refused to unite his powers with those of the Sultan. He declined to accede to Shahaji's terms. Shahaji was obliged to resort to an ungenerous stratagem. He gave out that he was desirous of entering into a marriage alliance with him and demanded the daughter of Srinivas Rao for his son Sambhaji, under pretense of arranging about the espousals, Srinivas Rao was invited to a feast at Shahaji's mansion, and when he came there in answer to the invitation, he was put under arrest. The towns of Junnar, Jeevdhan, Sonda, Ghorag and others which were under Srinivas Rao were now captured. The young Sultan was brought up from Bhimgad to Junnar. Shabaji next proceeded to bring under his power the Abis Anian chief, Saya Saf Khan, who like Srinivas Rao had become independent at Dhivandi and was raiding the neighborhood and likewise the Abyssinian Umbar who was pursuing the same tactics at Janjira. When the Emperor Shah Jaha heard of these events in the Deccan and learnt that the Nizamshahi dynasty had been restored and its territory all but reconquered by Shahaji, a great army was launched against him. A great battle took place at Perinda between the Mughal army and the forces of Shahaji who was aided by Bijapur. The Mughal army was overthrown. Then the emperor ordered Khan, Doran and Khan Jaman to start with a large army and crush the insurrectionary attempts of Shahaji. But these commanders also were much harassed by Shahaji, who was well supported by Randullah Khan and Murarpant of the Bijapur kingdom and had besides considerable forces of his own. This enabled him to defeat all the attempts of the Mughals against himself. Shah Jaha was naturally quite exasperated at the failure of these two expeditions and what stung him. Especially was the support lent by Bijapur to Shahaji. Shahaji had in a short time proved the Mughal triumphs over the Nijam Shahi and the extinction of that dynasty to have been a mockery. Affairs stood now in exactly the same posture in which they were at the commencement of the protracted war and the emperor was all the more incensed when he saw that he had now to deal with an adversary of more metal and superior powers of enterprise. In the height of his fury he declared his resolution to take the field in person with a mighty host to crush Shahaji and force him to restore all the territory and if occasion arose to extinguish the Mahomedan dynasties of Bijapur and Golconda. With this comprehensive program before him, the Mughal came down upon the Deccan with his invading hosts. His first maneuver was to separate Muhammad Adil Shah of Bijapur from the alliance with Shahaji by threats. He sent an ambassador to Adil Shah requiring him to surrender the Nijamshahi fortresses that had been taken by him. 
to return the famous piece of ordnance called the Maliki Medan superscript one which had been transferred from the fort of Perinda to Bijapur and not to lend any assistance to Shahaji and his partisans with a promise that if these conditions were complied with the emperor would make over to Bijapur all that portion of the Konkan which had once been under the Nizam Shahi with the fort of Sholapur and all the territory within its influence at the same time the emperor threatened to extinguish the Adil Shahi kingdom if these demands were not instantly obeyed the sultan of Bijapur paid little heed to these demands since Randulla Khan and the rest of the influential nobility were inclined to continue the alliance with Shahaji. Seeing that this plan was frustrated, Shah Jaha determined upon punishing the two powers together and dividing, for this purpose, his vast army into four columns he ordered two of them to march against Shabaji and the other two to advance against Bijapur. In command of the first column against Shahaji was Shasta Khan, whose charge was to subdue Chandia, Nasik, Sangamner, and other towns and the outlying districts and forts which were under Shahaji. The other, consisting of 20,000 horse, was under the command of Khan Jiman. His orders were to engage with Shahaji in the plain and put him to flight and reducing the Konkan hill forts leave him no rallying ground in any part of the Nizam Shahi territory. Thus at one and the same moment Shahaji had to bear the brunt of attacks by two large Mughal armies on two different fronts. But his courage did not waver for an instant. His resolution had been made to fight without flinching or yielding an inch of ground and he persisted in this noble resolve to the end. He put forth all the arts of a redoubted warrior and general. His consummate strategy, the rapidity of his move, men's and unerring tactics drew praise even from his bitterest foes. He did his best to harass the Mughals, but their great advantage of numbers began to tell in course of time and he had to face defeat in different directions. The Mughals took 25 of his forts in the districts of Nasik and Chandir. All the territory between Sholapur and Bedar slipped away from his hands. Many outposts in the Konkan were seized upon by the Mughals. Repulsed from the Konkan, Shahaji had to move to Ahmadnagar and wait in ambush. Both the Mughal columns now effected a junction and marched together upon him. Driven to great straits, he made good his escape from between their battle lines by a most dexterous movement and fell back upon the districts between Chambhargonde and Baramti. When the enemy followed on his rear into those parts, he diverted his flight to Kolhapur and Miraj. Receiving new reinforcements from Bijapur, he now turned back against the pursuing Mughals and began raiding their army and intercepting their fodder supplies. They had no energy left to give battle or to pursue Shahaji any further. When the news of these events reached Shah Jaha, he sent orders to Khan Jaman to let Shahaji alone, since his pursuit was attended with such severe losses to the imperial armies and to concentrate his forces against the Bijapur territory, as on the fall of that kingdom it would take little time to subdue Shahaji. In accordance with these orders, three Mughal generals invaded the Bijapur dominions, causing havoc in all directions. Many forts and towns fell before them, and thousands of the inhabitants were taken prisoners and sold into slavery. A large Mughal army marched straight upon Bijapur. The Sultan Adil Shah was seized with panic. He had no power to resist and opened negotiations. A peace was soon brought about between the two powers, on terms rather favorable to Bijapur. It was arranged by the treaty that the Adil Shahi dynasty should retain possession of the forts of Perinda and Sholapur, together with the territory between them, that the same Sultan should continue his authority over Bidar, Kalyani, and Naldurg to the east of Sholapur, and should retain the Malik Medan, the famous gun for which a demand had been made before the war.
that the parts of the Konkan that had once been held by the Nizam Shahi kings should be transferred to the Adil Shahi Sultan, as also the country watered by the Bhima and the Nira up to the fort of Chakan. In return for all this territory the Adil Shahi Sultan was to pay an annual tribute lakhs of horns to the Mughal Emperor, and the Raja Shahaji with his followers was to receive pardon on condition of surrendering all his forts and cannon and munitions of war. Should he not do so he was not to obtain any shelter within the limits of the Bijapur state, who were to look upon him as a public foe of their own no less than as an enemy of the Mughal Empire. By this treaty the kingdom of Bijapur extricated itself from its difficulties. Shahaji now lost his great ally and was quite isolated. Undaunted by this change of circumstances, he still held on. He was bent on fighting it out with the enemy. By the treaty with Bijapur, Shah Jaban's armies were now free to move. They were concentrated against Shahaji. They dogged his footsteps. Shahaji availed himself of an opportunity to descend into the Konkan and put his remaining fortresses in readiness for a long war. Soon after the Mughal armies poured down into the Konkan and took possession of the hill forts one after another. A contingent from Bijapur under Randulla. Khan Khan operated with the Mogula. Shahaji soon found himself in great extremity from which there was no escape possible except by submission. He petitioned the emperor for pardon and offered his services to the imperial army. His request was not complied with. In his reply the emperor reminded him of the mansab or military command that had once been conferred upon him, and how notwithstanding this he had declared hostilities with the empire, and had brought upon it immense losses by his rebellion. He could no more expect employment under the Mughal Empire, but he was free to enter the service of Bijapur. On receipt of this reply, Shahaji purchased his peace by surrendering to the Emperor the puppet Sultan whom he had raised to the Nijamshahi throne at Mahuli, and with the rest of his followers came down to Bijapur.